Nat King, King Cole played on this piano along with lots of other famous people like Bobby Darin. Um, this is one of the old Steinways that's been at Capitol forever. And it still sounds great. It's bright. It's full on the bottom. A lot of Steinways aren't bright. This one's full on the bottom, bright on the top, <coughs> even with the, the lid closed. Well, John Borlin, thank you so much for uh, meeting us down here at Capitol. My pleasure, Joe. Um, you kind of put the Eagles together, if what I understand. That was, yeah, the Eagles was put together. We put that band together to be Linda's backup band in 1971 for a tour when I uh, took over as, as her manager for a couple of years because uh, she was having some problems with management at that time. And uh, we, I hired Glenn and, and Don at the Troubadour Bar for $250 a week, and that was the beginning of the Eagles. We brought Randy in later. I had hired Randy to, to be in Ricky Nelson's Stone Canyon Band, another band I put together for, for Rick. And Linda was impressed with that band, so she asked me to put a band together for her, and that's when I hired Glenn and Don. Um, how did they become, how did they actually go from being her band to being the Eagles? Well, the very first tour, I mean, the, we, we got on the plane and Glenn and Don were hitting it off pretty well. They had never played together. And uh, Linda really liked Glenn's playing and she let him do a couple of songs in the show that he had written. And he, he did them and, uh, and Don played along on drums. Don was playing drums then. And uh, in a hotel room in Washington, D.C., when we were playing the cellar door, the two of them put their heads together and said, you know, we ought to start a band. Were they already really good writers at that time? They were not. I mean, Glenn had more experience than Don. Uh, they, they just started working on it then. and They collaborated a lot with all their, their friends, with each other, with Jackson Brown, with J.D., and a lot of the people who were around L.A. at that time. Did you go in the studio with them any as the Eagles We went into them? Muscle Shoals. When we were on the tour with Linda, we went into Muscle Shoals Sound and did a couple of demos on Glenn for David Geffen for, to let him hear how the band was shaping up. But that, those were very preliminary. And so how long was it after that that they actually became? It took about six months. And who do they finally end up getting to be their producer? Uh, Glenn Johns. I mean, that was the, I was, you know, Linda's manager and producing Linda. So when they signed with Asylum, uh, David Geffen signed them uh, after seeing them back Linda up. And uh, he put them with who then was probably one of the hottest rock producers in the world, Glenn Johnson. He took them over to England to do their first couple of albums. How, how did you meet Charlie and how did that come about? Well, Charlie was signed to the label I was working. I was at Epic then. I was in the A&R department. And we had signed Charlie a few years before. The year I got there, they signed him, and, and I was working on Boston, and Ron Luxemburg signed him. He'd been on Buddha. He'd been a crossover artist, and he was signed to the New York office. He was not a Nashville signing. And he'd made a couple of albums, and his sales were not kicking into the level that we needed them to based on the deal. So the head of the label, uh, Don Dempsey, said, would you take a run at Charlie? And I said, man, I'd be glad to, you know tremendous respect for Charlie as a musician all these years so I went to meet with him and and we hashed out some of the things I thought he could do and it worked out great the first record we cut together was Devil Went Down to Georgia yeah he went from a uh, quarter of a million units to three million units in one album we got very lucky and and Charlie really laid the groundwork for himself with his tireless touring and his working the system I mean the guy is just wonderful it was a lot of fun to do and I, I right away I knew it was strong when I heard it in the studio. In fact, I remember, uh, there's a good anecdote about that. I, I finished the record and I listened to the mix. I said, Charlie, this is really great. I said, however, there's this guy, Gordon McClendon. He's got a lot of radio stations in the South and he is not going to play a record that has the word son of a bitch in it. He's just not going to do it. I said, would you go back out there and just sing that one line again as son of a gun? Charlie said, yeah, you're right, I better do that. And we went out and he, he sang an alternate version. I done told you once, you son of a gun, I'm the best it's ever been. And I made a separate mix of that little section and stuck it on the back end of the reel. And then, you know, of course, there's a time lag between when an album comes out. We mastered the album the way it was. And I went off to Melbourne to do the Little River Band and uh, a couple of months later. And then I was down there about three or four weeks working away. And, I get this call in the middle of the night from the head of A&R who never could subtract. He 
calls me in the middle of the night. He says, John, Boylan, you got to get back here. We got to recut. Devil went down to Georgia. It's popping. It's going all over the place. It's going to be a huge hit, but these southern stations won't play that line. I said, Lenny, go. It's all done. I took care of it ahead of time. Look on the end of the reel. You'll find a little piece of tape. Just cut it in there and make an alternative. He said, oh, good. Because they didn't have to fly me back 18 hours from Australia to do it. It was all done. They, they cut it. They made a special single for, for radio. And the rest, as they say, is history. When something like that happens, it, it just like when Thriller hap happened, yeah. you know, it was good for everybody you well know. it kicked off the whole urban cowboy revolution you know right right after that we did the urban cowboy movie and i did like eight songs in that soundtrack including looking for love by johnny lee and uh you know that broke out of the movie and was my other million selling single i've only had two million selling singles and both of them came out of nashville at that time one was devil and one was looking for love hop out of nashville to boston how did that happen well i did boston before i did all this Boston was early on. I mean, I had heard this demo tape. Uh, my friend Paul Ahern, who, who was a promotion man at Asylum, uh, played me this tape in his car. And I thought, wow, that's great. The drums were badly recorded, uh, but the guitars were amazing. And, and he said, I'm getting pass letters on this thing. I said, I don't get it. I said, let's put a package together. Maybe they, maybe we can sell it. And we took it down to Epic. They were having a San Diego convention down there and we took it down there and we hit on Steve Popovich and Lenny Pizzi and finally they said okay we'll do it but you got to show us a band so we cobbled together some guys in Boston and, and and played a little bit and then we went to do the record and and when I went to work with Tom I realized right away that this was going to have to be a split production because he had his own way of working he wanted to keep his day job so all day long he would go to Polaroid and he'd come home and and play. So the way we did it is we cut the tracks and then I came back here to LA with the band and Tom would go to Polaroid every day, come home, his wife would make him dinner and he'd overdub into the night. How old a guy was he then? In his 20s. You know, he'd just graduated from MIT and he'd been hired by Polaroid as a design engineer. He was making tremendous money. It was a hard job for him to give up. As you can imagine, I mean, he was making more money than most rock and rollers. So when he finished the guitar overdubs, uh, I called a friend of mine in Providence who had a remote truck and he came to Cambridge and and ran a snake through uh, Tom's window and we transferred to the 24 track in the truck and then brought them out here and I cut three tracks out here without Tom then we went into Studio C did all the vocals and uh, put put it all together and we mixed it down at Westlake that weeks. first album is sold 17 million copies wow. that's right it's the largest selling debut album in the history of the business how did Tom come up with that? The rock man? The rock man, yeah. Yeah, it was a circuit that he designed. I mean, he was good at that. He had a, a way of recording. Uh, what he did is he took a, a resistor, you know, a basic variable resistance uh, pot, and he put it in between the, the Marshall head and the cabinet so that he could overdrive the head and not make too much noise. Uh, and He later put that out and called it the power soak. He had to do it because he was recording in his basement. He couldn't make a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. And the, the sound that that made was kind of special. And then he had a special EQ that he, that he would use on it. And he, he knew that the sound was pretty amazing. So he invented two things to go with it, an analog delay device, a kind of a bucket brigade mm -hmm. device. And he bought himself a special uh, oscillator oscilloscope that would freeze a waveform and he would take he had somebody at Polaroid make him a camera to take pictures of the waveform and once he could take a picture of the waveform then he could design a circuit to recreate it and that became the rock man <laughs>